Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this special observance of Indigenous Peoples Day presented by the Environmental Studies Program and the Pauli Friedman Art Gallery at Misericordia University. My name is Lelaine Little, Director of the Pauli Friedman Art Gallery. This program is being recorded and we have both a virtual and a live audience. For those with low vision, I have salt and pepper like shoulder length hair, I'm wearing a denim jacket and a button that says you can do hard things over a pink dress. I want to thank the university and the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as the universe, friends of the university who have invested in our students and our programs. We are located in Dallas, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeastern Pennsylvania. These lands were the ancestral homelands of indigenous peoples, including the Delaware and Lenape people. As a Sisters of Mercy institution, we reflect on the critical concerns of stewardship of the earth and dismantling institutional racism. As part of our responsibility to reconcile those who were forcibly displaced, we will be working in partnership with Native American organizations to develop our official land acknowledgement statement, so please look forward to this evolving initiative. To tell you more about the Environmental Studies program is Dr. Linda Ocker, Assistant Professor of Biology and Director of the Environmental Studies program. Thank you so much, Lane, and thank you, Holly, for uh, allowing us to, to talk about your artwork. I'm really excited that you know, this, to my recollection, this is our first Indigenous Peoples um, set of events, and this is this is wonderful, and I'm honored that environmental studies can be a part of this. Um, so environmental studies is a brand new program. Um, it's really just getting off the ground this year. Um, it is sponsored by the National Endowment for Humanities, um, and is the, the whole point of our environmental studies program is to bring both a humanitarian um, or humanist, excuse me, and scientist perspective to understanding the environment and solving environmental issues. So we look forward to getting things off the ground um, and, and inviting students to, to take our courses and um, learn more about the environment. Thanks so much, Linda. So we are now going to um, introduce you to our newly minted, oh, hang on a second, I have to unpin this. Um, there we go. Our newly minted Assistant Vice President for Mission and Institutional Diversity, Cass Williams, who's going to tell you how this program relates to the university's larger mission. So let's see here. Okay, thank you all so much uh, for being here today and recognizing Native Indigenous Day. Uh, welcome on behalf of the office that I represent, and that is of Mission and Institutional Diversity. And I love the title of that office for several different reasons, but when we say institutional diversity, we're really talking about what Dr. Little mentioned before, dismantling some things that we see that are there and some that we may not see that are there. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you to the organizers of the event. Thank you to everybody on the screen. I'm looking back like I can see you, but we know you can see the artwork. Um, thank you for acknowledging the original caretakers of this land. Because you see, before this was a space of Mission Reporting University, this was home to our Native Indigenous people. And but not for their full sacrifices, none of us will be here. And for that, I'm so humbled. I brought with me today, well, she came on her own, but we were talking about the event. One of our Native Indigenous students here, Christina, thank you so much for being here, being an advocate. And I'm getting old, so I keep doing this with these glasses here, so. Before I came here, I lived in South Dakota for about seven years. Um, and if you know anything about South Dakota and the rich history, um, especially with the Sioux tribe, it, it does become a little political. Uh, some of the things that I did with some of my students, we went out to the Dakota Access pop, pop, Pipeline um, and did some protests out there. And as we talk about land and environment um, and water and how important these things are to our Native Indigenous people, we start to learn a different respect and understanding for what that means. I also did some work advocating for our missing and murdered indigenous women because we start to talk about how we take advantage of the most vulnerable people in our community. So this work is important. Recognizing Native Indigenous Day is important. And understanding about spirituality, what the land means, what the mountains mean, the history of all of that. And that's why I appreciate the artwork uh, that we have here today because it is an, an appreciation of land and water and what's natural to us. 
Um, but in some of the conversations that I had with some of my friends who are Native American, especially assisted in Wapiton um, of the Sioux tribe in, in South Dakota, we would always have these conversations about marginalized people, about what that looked like and about what that meant. And we stumbled on this conversation, and I won't say stumble, but it's a conversation we needed to have about land and acknowledging land and the land acknowledgement and what that meant. So here you have a group of African-Americans speaking with native indigenous people about land. And in that conversation, I remember someone saying, you know, well, they, they owe us 40 acres and a mule. Now me being who I am, there's nothing I can do with a mule today. Give me a Cadillac, give me a Nissan, I'll do something with, but a mule I can't do anything with. But then when we started talking about land and why haven't we been given our land as African-Americans, and one of my friends who was African-American said, who are they to give us something that was stolen? And that sat deep with me and it gave me a point of clarity that there is a connection, an interconnectedness between marginalized people, land and survival. For that, that was important for me. That was my point of clarity. That was my understanding of what regional racism looked like because I'm originally I'm from Louisiana and I tell people, the way we treat Native Americans, especially in South Dakota, is equivalent to how we treat African Americans in the South. And if we don't recognize the space that we come into and how we occupy space and use space, and really, and when we talk about land acknowledgement, all that the Native Indigenous people are asking is that you just acknowledge that they were here. That is the starting point of a conversation. So before I get too deep into too much history here, I wanna say thank you for being here students. I saw you busting down the doors to get in here and signing up on that sheet. If you didn't, please do. If not, she'll remind you to do so. But please take into consideration the seriousness of this work and the passion. And thank you also to Holly for being here uh, to share and discuss some of the work that she's gonna to talk to us and to talk about. just look at it, it's just beautiful within itself. Um, so I will now turn the program back over to our wonderful hostess with the mostess. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to uh, share with you a, a message for, from our university president, Dr. Dan Myers, who is traveling at the moment, but he recorded a special message for Indigenous people today that I would like to share with you all. So um, here we go. Hopefully we have sound. Um, I have very, very high hopes. So. Hello, my name is Dan Myers and I'm the president of Misericordia University. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to Ms. Recordia's events in support of Indigenous Peoples Day. As some of you know, the cause of Indigenous people is very close to my heart and has been a matter of lifelong concern because of one of the most important people in my life, my adopted brother, Tim, who is of native descent and lives on the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon. Our environmental studies program, directed by Professor Linda Auker, is hosting two wonderful events in conjunction with Fine Arts and the Polly Friedman Art Gallery. The first is the pop-up exhibition of One Fish, Two Fish by Holly Wilson, which includes a virtual artist talk with gallery director Lane Little. The second is a screening and discussion of Dawnland, hosted by Professor Ryan Watson. I am grateful to the Environmental Studies Program and to all who have worked on these events. It is so important for universities to shine light on social justice for Native Americans and to make space for better understanding of these neglected issues. I'm proud to be part of a community that reflects its founding values so well, and I applaud you for participating. Thank you for being a part of today's events. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. And I know he wanted to be here, but as you, as a new president with many demands on his time, so I'm grateful that he took the time to make that video for us. I first encountered the work of Holly Wilson in 2019 at the Institute of the American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her bronze work, We Need a Hero, was configured very similarly to One Fish, Two Fish, which you see behind me. We Need a Hero features a little boy standing on a paper airplane as he emerges from the wall untouched as he flies through a shower of bombs. I was struck by the magnitude of his task and the apparent determination evident in his chest and shoulders as he confronted the viewer with an unflinching gaze as if someone merely challenged him to jump off the high diving board at the pool. 
When given the opportunity to present an artist for Indigenous Peoples Day this year, especially after our, our current exhibition closed, which is on immigration and on uses of the land and our welcoming of, of people to these lands, my mind went straight to Holly. Holly has master's degrees in sculpture and ceramics. Her work has been shown by Crystal Bridges Museum in, of Art in Arkansas, the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, the Gilchrist Museum of Oklahoma. And I will let Holly um, introduce herself and then Dr. Offer and I will lead off with a few questions. And then we'll take questions from our live and our virtual audience as well. So please post your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom if you're online and um, like give me an eyebrow raise or something if, if you're in the live audience. And we'll take the last question at about 6.25 and end at 6.30 p.m. This program is being recorded and an edited version will be made available on the gallery's YouTube channel. And with that, everyone, please welcome Holly Wilson. Hello, how are you? Um, Holly Wilson, I'm in um, Mustang, Oklahoma, in the studio, as uh, I pointed out to you earlier. Um, I wasn't really sure how you wanted to go about this. I don't have a presentation put together. I can just kind of start talking about the work if you'd like um, that you see behind. Um, one of the things you asked was if I drew on mythology or ideologies or anything like that. But for me, all the work I create starts with something that's a message. I'll see something and it'll connect to me. Um, and then from there it builds and materials are picked based on what that message is. And I never start out a thing saying, well, I'm gonna make something about this and then try and figure out how to do it. It normally just kind of hits me. And the piece you described about the little boy was very much like that. And that was about watching our kids in our world and how they navigate. And I was watching my kids watch TV and there was just such horrible things coming at them. And it was made to be funny. And so they had these laugh tracks rolling in on really awful behavior. And it was one of the things that as a parent, I kind of like completely clenched up, but as an artist, it made me think about how could I, how could I take that story? And so um, that's kind of where that piece built. And it was about the idea of the bombs are all the things that are coming at our kids in the world um, from TV to media, to social media, to environmental things and they're, and they're being aimed at them. And then they're told, guess what? You get to go defend it now. We've made a mess and we've done this to you. And now as young people, you get to go clean up the messes we've created. So that's all the bombs. And then the other part were the little paper airplanes. And those are the idea of those were all his messages going out into the world. And some were, I called the messages of hope. So, and I get all verklempt when I talk about my work. So um, I apologize. Um, so it's the idea that every one of those is a hand folded piece of paper that my kids and I folded. And some of those messages will never be seen. They'll burn up. So there were some burnt baby airplanes and then some will make it into the world and be heard. And it's that idea. So when you talk about um, ideologies or stories, for me, all the work has to do with me in the present and then looking at my kids. And then from that, there's always this layer of what I learned historically from my mom and dad or my great grandparents. And so there's always this kind of layering when I think about the work um, and almost like undercurrents for stories. And what I, I like about that way of working is one, the work typically, I hope, <laughs> has meaning in the world, but it also has something that other people can connect to. So whether it be a native person or a non-native person, you could see yourself in that role, in that piece of art, and you could see your family or your kids or you know, fill in the blank. And the one fish, two fish, um, it's kind of funny. So the fish, I was trying to find fish that were from the area up the Eastern area. Um, Cause the fish play a role in multiple pieces that I have. I have another piece I'm working on um, and it's called the guardian and the guide. And it actually was in that same exhibition you originally saw. And it had 30 sterling silver fish on a table and it had a woman and, a, and there was a bird and the woman was part stick. And it's this idea that I feel like as people, we are, um, we rely on nature to sustain us and we need to be the guardians of that. And I feel like right now we're not, we're, we're, and I live in Oklahoma where they're digging oil up and fracking as fast as they can. 
in the hopes of making a buck, but the problem is we're actually polluting our water and our ground. And the, the, the part that distresses me is not only is it our drinking water and the water that we feed our animals, but it's the water that we put on our food. And so there's all these chemicals that are going back into us that should never be going into us, but it's, it's kind of wiped away. So that's one of the pieces that is for my upcoming show in New York, it's called, um, I'm, re, I'm retooling that piece, but it's called The Guardian and the Guide. And um, this, the things in the work um, that are material matters. So sometimes it'll just be bronze because bronze allows me to make things delicate and, and hard to do in clay because my original undergrad was in ceramics. But the, the bronze, I can make something stand on its tippy toe and, and I can't do that in all my other materials. So then I'll bring in things that have meaning. So the fish in that piece that's coming, it, they're sterling silver because the idea is they're precious. And so sterling silver is a precious metal. But the fish that I looked at for that piece and one, two, one fish, two fish is actually called a weak fish, which I don't have a lot of knowledge of, but I did love the way it looked. So that's where the fish originated from. And um, when I was, my, my kids, I started making, I mean, I've been making art pre-kids and then I didn't stop just because I had kids. I would just work in weird hours. Um, and then playroom became studio room. So I dragged the Dora the Explorer mat in and the Thomas the Trains and my son would sit across from me and he would play Play-Doh and build these sculptural things and my daughter would paint. And so my work also has a real connection to a story because we tell stories. My mom was a storyteller. She would tell stories that were from my grandparents. And then I started doing it with my own kids. So like one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, you know, it's a Dr. Seuss story that I remember just hearing again and again. And in this piece in particular, it's the idea that, um, do you know when you're first falling asleep and you're, you're, you've closed your eyes and you're trying to go to sleep and maybe you have an ocean machine making noise or music and you're just drifting. And it's this moment when you fall and everything's really big or small and there's a blackness. And it's almost like all the things of your day start running across your mind. Did I say that nice? Could I be better? How could I get this done? What's tomorrow? And it's all these little pieces of information that are flying around in your mind. And it's all these possibilities. And so the one fish, two fish is the girl. And it's like, she's in this ocean of possibilities. And it's a weird thing. Cause you know, fish are, there's so many different kinds of fish too. And some of them look really old if you get up close. And some of them are real small and they're little baby ideas. And some are big old ideas, but it's that idea that it's all these things. And it's weird because as a native person, as a, as a woman, you know, my mom was never like, oh, you can't do that because you're a girl or you can't do that because you're this. She was just like, if you, if you want it and my dad, same thing, you have to make it happen, you know? And I mean, with my age, I won't divulge, but when I went to art school, most of my friends, it was were like, well, what are you going to go study design? No, I, I went for photography. And my parents were like, if you love it, you will figure out how to make it work. And that was a rare thing to hear because most of the time you had to have a plan. And so I very much tell people all the time, even my own children, you know, you need to find something that you get giddy about getting up in the morning to do that you could do all day and lose track of time because at the end of it, that brings you joy. And then you can put that out into the world and then it becomes something and and you'll figure out, even if it means you have to be a coffee barista, you'll find a way that that works. And that's what this idea is. This girl has this kind of smirk and it's all, it could be the good things, the bad things, the possible things. And so that's what that is. And I'm kind of hung up on numbers. So things are always odd numbers or they're uh, like the circle thing. So there's like 30 fish in that piece, um, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, well, maybe not. Maybe that was the 30 sterling silver fish. Now I'd have to like go back and think about it. Um, I thought there was 30, but there may not be. There is. 
<laughs> it's a weird thing. It's like, ah, and then my number, my other number is seven. And seven is because, um, cause you talk about like ideas and they're weird little things. But for me, it's like seven is a number. I'm, my family is seven. I was born at 701. My dad's family had a house at 107, but then there's also seven directions. And so for the Cherokee, there's um, the regular north, south, east, west, but there's the above, the below, and here. And I always see here as like the heart, the soul, like where you are. And so I always think about numbers in that way and how they tie back. So um, uh, yeah, that, that's a little overview there. Did that, was that a good introduction? <laughs> I think so. Could you talk, uh, just to um, give people a little bit of background, can you talk about which nations you identify with and how are those defined um, for you? So, so yeah, um, we're, um, uh, so I've been doing a lot of research because of the last show, but we're Delaware Nation, uh, and that's where my tribal card is. So, and then, but we're also Cherokee, out of Tahlequah. And then um, that Cherokee is also Delaware as well. So they're mixed Delaware Cherokee, but they're on the Cherokee rolls. And then my Delaware Nation family has, I found recently Shawnee, absentee Shawnee mixed in as well. So, um, and that's all from my mother's side. And on my dad's side, they have, and it's one of the things I'm gonna be working on this spring is to look more into it. There is a Cherokee link and I have name and information and I'm gonna go do a little more research on that. But for the most part, he's just, you know, the, the, the Scottish, um, you know, white guy. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but his last name originally was Campbell. Um, so the family name was Campbell, so it's Scottish but it's Wilson, so, uh, but they met at um, um, the Fort Sill Indian School. My dad was a teacher at the Indian School in Lawton. And it's a weird thing because right now there's a lot of information in the news about boarding schools. And it, it's odd because I grew up at the Fort Sill Indian School for a lot of years. My dad taught there until they closed the school in 1980. He worked uh, for a little while also in um, Cherokee at the boarding school there, but it was a later, like it was the 70s, 80s. So there was this weird pendulum swing from boarding schools that were set up by the churches and children were removed and a lot of really horrible thing happened to boarding schools that then became where um, a place to go because there was no other place. My mom grew up there with her mother. Um, her mother was a cook and then my mother lived there. But it was a weird time because it was at that time you had to be out of restaurants. You couldn't, you couldn't be in some places in town. I mean, there's the black uh, water fountains. It applied to the natives here as well. You know, you couldn't be in certain neighborhoods after sundown. So there, there was, you know, your, um, I think president was talking about the parallels, and there are a lot of parallels as to how the two communities were treated. Um, and so that was something that is kind of different, like when I think about our boarding school experience, and we just, my dad worked there as a teacher, and then he met my mom. So it's kind of a strange other history. <laughs> Linda, I'm gonna throw the next question to you. Sure. Um, so first of all, as a biologist, I was really excited that you, you mentioned that the weak fish was your model yeah. and cause it kind of has this interesting unintentional, um, symbology, if you will, because the weak fish is called that because the muscles around his mouth are very weak. So they tear easily when people would try to catch them on a hook. So they were able to escape. So, okay. you know, when, when I think about those thoughts racing back and forth in my mind, <laughs> there's nothing I can really capture, like I'm kind of drifting through them. So I thought that was really cool. Well, that's <laughs> awesome. I love that. <laughs> I love the name of that fish though. It's like yeah. fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, one of our questions is how can Native American culture 
be brought to the forefront when we're talking about environmental issues? Because um, I know that's going to be something you know we're going to be talking about in our courses and kind of really how to put the spotlight on uh, a lot of the Na Native American culture. Because I, you know, we we hear about the water defenders, and you know, it, it seems to be the peoples who are really on the front line trying to fight against environmental degradation are Native peoples. I'm going to first say I am not an expert at this at all. Um, I wish I knew, I wish I did better. I wish I knew more. Um, but I would say the biggest thing with that is there are people who have been here longer and taken care of the land. And most natives, it was never about ownership. It was about caretaking and working in a symbiotic relationship because you move from one place to go hunt and then you move to another place you know, for a different time of the season and you didn't wear out the soil in what you planted, you know, so it's things like that. And that is something that you're hearing now. Um, I listened to NPR until they let the pajama people on and uh, that's when I get off. But I love just recently there was a story and they were bringing that up where so much of the time people are planting crops and they're exhausting the, the soil and they're now finding there are certain crops you can plant in between that actually, you know, peas that bring this richness back to the soil and it helps all of the different, um, the different foods that they're planting. The other one is also about um, thinking about the water and how you treat the water. And, you know, we've historically been damming things up or um, like one of the worst crops that we have actually is yards, uh, which I think is hysterical, is watering your yard and the fertilization of it and the poisons that you're leaching back into the water system, but just the sheer waste of it. And I mean, I'm a guilty person, but what I did to the last two yards that we've lived in is I make part of it a garden. And so I have all, you know, the things I want to keep um, longer into the winter, I plant closer to the brick because the brick will then radiate heat back onto my tomatoes and it lets them last into November where if they're out in the middle of the yard, they don't get that. So it's just little things about thinking about how can you work with what's there and not putting poisons and toxins into your water because you don't want to eat or drink that. So I think about that as Native people, some of that, you know, my mom and them talked about but some of it is just also common sense. And then there's the, the other part um, that I thought was really interesting up in Idlewild, California, I do a camp, I teach a class up there in the summers, but there's, um, and I'm, I can't remember the name of the community of the native community that has been up there. And one of the things they did is they, it's, and Gerald will kill me if he found out, I can remember his tribe, um, but they've been caretaking for that mountain range forever. And one of the things they do is there's a time that you burn, there's animals that you can let eat and take care of the underbrush. And so part of the burning and the fires that we're having is because we haven't cared for the land in a way that would allow the land to grow. And so we're losing things that are massive trees in California that should never die because of the fires that are happening. Um, but then it's funny because there are some fires that are okay because the fires they find are what actually opens up the pods in some of these big um, sequoias that then allow the seeds to come out. So you see that like there's nature saying, yes, we don't mind a little underbrush burning, but we would prefer you not to destroy us. Uh, you know, so it's that I feel like there's this idea of listening and finding some of those older ways. And there's also so much to do with natural medicines that has also not even been looked at in things that you can eat that will make you feel better. Uh, I mean, as simple as like ginger, you know, for upset stomachs or cranberries and just different types of food. There's a really great class that they have um, where again, I a while, they have a whole native week. That's why I, I get all excited about it. Um, Joe Baker is one of, um, he's a Delaware as well. And he's one of the people who helps coordinate that. And they bring in artists and music people and they also bring in people to do with food. And so there's a whole little section about natural cooking and you know um, natural medicines and stuff that some people, some people have books on. And I really think if that came, if you found a way to bring that back in, cause that's old science. 
And um, I think old science has a really good leg. So don't know if that helps. <laughs> I don't know a lot of old science myself. I've actually, in my work recently, I have a new series that I've been doing with the plants and the sticks. But one of the things is I want to start looking at what the plants represent. So the meaning of the plants would play as much a role in this concept of the art as what they mean in life. Because there's some things that are, you know, nightshade plants and poisons that you don't even realize, but then they have really great things to them as well. Like the poke plant is poisonous, but at the same time, it's an amazing dye. So it's looking at some of those things where it's like, well, don't put it in your mouth, but you can dye your clothes. <laughs> there's a little common sense I think we're all missing. So absolutely. Thank you. That was great. I, I keep thinking about a lot of that, the burning, especially in, in the plains kind of kept the, you know, the for the prairies, the grasslands open. And as the that stopped, right, as uh, as we had fewer and fewer native people in those areas, the forest kind of crept in. And that's what allowed things like, is it the barred owl to move across over to the western, you know, pen, uh, I almost said Pennsylvania, that's not right. Oregon area and just out compete the, the spotted owls. So there's definitely some evidence that, you know, that natural, that prescribed burning was really, you know, helping a lot. You know, and on the burning again, there's a place I'm doing a show uh, in a month in Kansas, uh, Alma, Kansas. It's the Volen store. And um, one of the things we're talking about there, I went and I collected all kinds of plant life from there, but they do that. It's uh, the Flint Hills and they still participate in all of that um, burning at certain times and what it does by removing the things that are, you know, dangerous for the prairie, but then it also allows for parts for the animals to be able to graze and have, you know, really good food. So I, I find it really interesting to see and how we have stopped doing so many of those things that are simple. But. I'm grabbing a question out of the chat box. Um, when and where you will you be teaching a class? What will you be teaching and how can someone enroll? Ah. <laughs> well, so there is a place called Idlewild Summer Arts Institute and it's in Idlewild, California. And it's in the summers and they have uh, week long classes. And I normally teach a class either on um, bronze casting, small scale bronze casting. So you can learn to cast something like what you see behind you. And it teaches you how to use wax, how to invest it, how to cast it, how to clean it up, how to patina it. Or the other class I do is um, encaustic, 3D encaustic, because when I couldn't cast, I actually started doing encaustic work with it, which is a very, the, the oldest painting. It's a uh, beeswax and Darmar crystals and powdered pigments all mixed together. But I do it in more of a sculptural way. So I do relief sculptural work. And those are the two, I've done two classes every summer, but I think this summer um, it's only one, but I don't know which one. And so if you just go to their website, they'll have, you can email, uh, I'll have listings for information, but it's in like July, June, July. Last two years, we have not had it. So <laughs> I'm hopeful this summer will happen. Um, so actually, we'll describe um, uh, One Fish, Two Fish for the low vision folks who may not be able to see it completely. Um, so one fish, two fish is bronze patina, and correct me, is it bronze and patina, or is it yeah. bronze? It's bronze with patina. Mm -hmm. Patina, okay. And then uh, there, is, there are, as Holly said, 30 fish of various um, configurations, mostly the weak fish it looks like, with a double fin in the background of different sizes. And then there's a central figure that's a, a girl and her dress is sort of billowing out and her um, limbs are extended or feet in her hands. And um, I, I was trying to get the lighting right, Holly, because we only have like direct spots. And so it looks like she has like all of these sort of spidery limbs coming out. I love um, that. <laughs> 
And uh, actually, if uh, we have a, do, we do have a question in the chat box, but before we get to that, can you talk a little bit about how you configured the little girl? Because it seems like her um, hands and her feet are enlarged, um, are the kinds of ab just abstractions that you chose in your figures, because they're all very, um, very unique to your practice, I think, um, the way you do your figures. Yeah, it's interesting because um, they're not completely anatomically correct. I will say that up front, but I do use, um, I use my kids or myself um, as models for, okay, how's that arm go? How does that face go back? Um, but one of the things I really love is, um, like Rodan was a great example. You know, his figures had bigger hands and feet. And I always think about it as this idea that they've walked a long way and they've carried a bunch. And so even though they kind of look like kids, if you get up close, they kind of look more like old people in the way the limbs are uh, delineated or the fingers are a lot more bony in their structure and a little, bo a little more gnarled um, than fat and juicy like little kids. You know, they're their, their shapes are not as, um, kids' shapes aren't nearly as defined, but from first glance, you, most people think that my pieces are real children. So that's been a thing that's kind of carried all the way through the work. And the size, initially, um, I used to make real mixed sizes, ups and downs, and then it got to where I had my, I had to cast in my own studio, um, and it, it turned out that I loved this one size because it was the perfect shape that could draw you in. You could see the detail, but then it, you could get back and have, you know, 10 of them or, you know, 20 of them, like the crayon piece that I did. They're all the same size girls from the waist up, you know, and I could have 244 of them on a wall. And so it's this interesting size that I kind of like. Um, it's something that you don't feel too, in, I, I either like things really small or I like things really, really big. And that's kind of my thing is, because the in-between you're not quite as intimidated by, you know, with the work. So, you know, if that helps. <laughs> yeah, those are all um, interesting choices, I think, that we don't necessarily think about. We know the impact of it, because we know what we feel, how we respond to it, but we're not sure exactly what the artist is doing to evoke those responses. So the hands and feet as, as tools for caring, I think is really important for your work. Um, for Maureen in the chat, can you say more about the significance of the number seven in your culture? As you probably know, the number seven has significance in many religions and cultures. And did you know that we have a natural area here called seven tubs? Oh, no, I didn't. Um, that's interesting. No, seven, like I said, the biggest thing that I'm connected to is the directions. There's also clans. There's seven clans for the Cherokee. Um, and I couldn't tell you all of them, and I'm sorry. Um, I should know them all, but I don't. Um, so for me, it's it, my biggest connection to seven is the directions. And then my second connection is to the strange family connection to seven, um, which has kind of followed me around. And it's, a, it's an odd thing, even when I look at addresses, I'm like, what's the address? If I add those letters up, does that make seven? And it's a silly thing, but it's one that's kind of stuck with me. I just did a piece that was a girl and she had a bear mask and um, her shirt was a tank shirt. And that's what the number seven, it was like a gym shirt. And I had to put the number seven on it for that idea again of, you know, the directions. Cause I, I, I really, I think I'm closely tied to that idea of directions. I have another piece that is um, a piece called uh, I'm still here and it's two small girls, but they're really the same girl. Um, and it was based off doing research on boarding schools and how in the beginning they would cut their hair. And there was this whole passage about how you could hear the hair hit the bucket and they couldn't speak their language. And so it was this idea of feeling disconnected you couldn't practice your religion and you'd already been removed from your family and so it was this idea of losing who you are and at the same time I was looking this information that my sister um, had found out she had cancer and so we had been talking about she went through chemo and radiation and she lost her hair and she goes it's really weird because I see who I am in the mirror but I realized there's a part of me that's gone, 
but I'm still here. And she says when she was in public, people wouldn't make eye contact with her. You know, people that she'd known at the grocery store and she was a teacher and even some of the other people that she taught with, they had a really hard time making eye contact. And she would, she told me, she goes, it was really devastating because she goes, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still me. All of me is still here. And it's that idea I thought about how, so this is another thing at looking at um, how the work connects, how I connect work is, I looked at cancer and like what happened in the boarding schools as a parallel, like neither one of them, you couldn't, nobody would ask to be given cancer and nobody would ask to be removed from their family. It was a, it was a disease that was inflicted on them by people or by, and I personally still think a lot of cancer is something that we're doing to our food and our water and our air because the numbers are just astounding. And when she got cancer, I also started doing a lot of research and listening to, there was a fabulous documentary um, that talked about cancer in three parts and how when the industrial revolution, uh, re revolu can't say it, re whatever that word is, happened and all the coal and all of that started, that's when you really started seeing cancer just kind of go off the charts. And it was something that you never even knew was happening. And then bloodborne and all the stuff that they were doing. And it was just such an interesting parallel, how it's something that society kind of did, but you couldn't control. And then, so in the front girl, the front figure, it's a girl and she has no hair and she has ears. And so in my pieces, you'll see things that if they're real people, and this is odd, but they have ears. If they're not a real person, if they're a figment of, if they're a concept of a person, I never give them ears. So I know that sounds odd because a person, you, you have to hear somebody say something to you, but if you're more a concept, if you're more a spirit, you don't have to hear things, you just know things. And so that's one of my like little, I don't always talk about it, but that's one of my things that delineates the two kinds of figures that they are. And they may look the same, and in this one, the girl had thick braids in the back. And uh, my sister always complained about her thick braids when she was a kid. Um, and she's got her eyes closed and she, they both have their eyes closed. And the fat girl is whispering something into her ear. And her other hand has her fingers crossed behind her back. And she's barefoot and the girl in the front has shoes. And that's also the first time I've ever put shoes on anybody. And they're standing on a stump of a huge tree that's been cut and a step has been cut into it. So it's this idea that man came along and they cut this tree that's thousands of years old trying to destroy these people. Um, and they put a step there to civilize that step. That tree is gonna be civilized. It's gonna be a step now. And so the girl with the shoes, who is the girl who has cancer is on the step. And then the girl in the back is still kind of wild and she's whispering, I'm still here. So she's telling herself, I'm still here. But around them, when you cut a big tree down, what a lot of people don't realize is as bad as that is, it also gives light to the saplings. And so that next generation grows up. And so around the big tree base is seven saplings. Again, the number seven. Um, and so with the death of that big tree, the next generation of trees are growing up. And then they make a canopy above the two girls. And from there are hanging origami cranes from the story of the girl, where if you made a thousand cranes, you could wish you could get rid of cancer. You know, she had her, her wish of cancer being gone. And I love that story about that idea that if you, you did something that was so methodical and so, because folding a crane is not easy. <laughs> Every time I fold one, I have to watch the video. Um, so I put that little bit of mythology in with the story and then they're standing on a hill um, and I always think of Cherokee because uh, we lived on top of the mountain in Cherokee and so that that piece right there you know I think about the seven and then the symbolism of the hair and the girls and the ears and then the tree and the tree is is this native people and then man is what's tried to cut and civilize at the same time they tried to cut us down and put in boarding school and civilize us and remove the nature from who we are kind of idea so I don't know if I answered the question you asked me. It's amazing, I think, because I feel like 
with, if, if my students should ever go into museums and see your work, they'll be able to identify, given these little clues, given these little numerical um, significance. I think it's, it's great for students to have those tools to look at art in that way. We have this question in the chat from Bernadette Torres. She would like to know two things. One, do you send each gallery direction for lighting or installing, or do you leave it up to each gallery? And the second is of all your art materials, which one is your favorite and why? Um, so normally when I install work, and I love that you did this, I, I, I consider shadows part, first off, hey, Bernadette, I know her. Um, uh, I consider shadow as much an important part of my work as the work itself, because I think of shadow as memory. Um, so I have a piece that's um, bloodline and it's the big tree piece and there's 13 logs and each log represents um, a generation. And then on the top of each log are these figures that I call cigar figures and they're made actually from the body of a butt of a cigar, sticks and then they have feet and silhouette type heads. But in that piece, the importance of that piece is that the shadow is cast on the wall behind it. And the reason is so much of what you think about when I think of work and I think about my history is we're all shadows in the end. I mean, we'll have made a, you'll, you'll do something, I'll make art and my art will be there. But like who I am becomes a shadow, like in a memory. And so when I think about memories of people and times, some are really clear and then some fade. And I think about that as shadows, like when a light is cast, you'll have the really sharp shadow and then you'll have the, the, the fainter shadows. And to me, so I always think about how important that gives depth to the work in a physical way, but also in a psychological way, thinking about the shadows and how they lay. Um, so when I, norm I normally help install most all my shows, and that's one of the biggest things is to get the shadows to where they're dramatic. And pieces like the one you have there, I have another one. Um, it is important that you get the shadow to cast the legs so you have this extra, it's almost this idea of movement too. Um, and what was the other part of her question? Oh, material, my favorite. You know, I, 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 I don't have a favorite material in one way, to me, it's the material for what it does. Um, I'm kind of, I mean, I went originally, I, would, I did drawing and painting in high school and fell madly in love with photography. And I went to art school for photo and then I got there and then I fell in love with sculpture and then I did clay and I grad school, I did clay and until I stumbled into jewelry and jewelry is how I started casting sculptures. Cause I love that I no longer had to worry about Here's a great example. So here's a little piece called Paper Wings. So Paper Wings can stand on his toe. That's it, just right there, because this is metal and it doesn't break. And so when I was in art school with Bernadette was a year ahead of me, I used to make figures out of clay, just a little bit bigger than this. And some, something that get fired and bumped and I'd be like, nobody move, I've lost toes, I've lost a toe, I've lost a finger. And so I'm constantly looking for things that can't be any more than like this big. And it was so frustrating. But then again, I love clay because it has this sensual feel to it. So for me, material is important for what it can do. So I don't have one favorite, like there's times that it's photography because of what it can do. And sometimes it's metal and sometimes it's silver and sometimes it's clay and wood. And like, I love, um, the, some of the different pieces I've cast, are not cast, but used um, in, in um, my bloodline pieces have actually been on cedar. And like in bloodline itself, when you cut the log in half, it looks like, it looks like a blood vessel, like a scientific blood vessel. And that's where like that vein, you know? And so there's the bloodline of the family on top, like a literal history of who I was all the way back but then you see this tree and when the tree is cut open, you see all the lines to the tree. So you see the life of this tree and then you have the people in their lives on top and then they ride on top of this log. And it's this idea of how they work together, both man and nature. And you're seeing both of their lives. You're seeing all the hundreds of years that this tree has been alive. And then you see all the family. So I don't really have one. <laughs> 
I find beauty in all kinds of little pieces and pods and things. For our last question, I'm going to check in with our live audience, and I'm going to I'm going to pan the camera around you guys. So, uh, give another wave for your classmates online. Oh, oh gosh, that's shy waves. All right. So, does anyone from do you guys have any questions? All well, nodding their heads. Would you like to see Holly Wilson more? Holly Wilson's work here at the gallery. Yeah. All right, they're all nodding their heads. So I think we're gonna have to um, bring you back for like a, more than just a pop-up show, knowing what we know about your artwork. I think uh, it's it's worth taking a, a closer look for a little bit longer. What do you think, Linda? That would be awesome. So I will, uh, <laughs> Linda, I will have you um, uh, close out then. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Holly, um, for taking time to talk with us, talk with the students. Um, this is our first, they mentioned Indigenous Peoples event, and we're just so excited we we're able to do this. Um, I have to say, I, I walked into the art gallery earlier today, going from a class to a meeting and had lots of time to spend really like looking at the details of each fish. And I was just like, this is, you know, as a marine biologist, I was like, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> so I, I absolutely love it. And um I really enjoyed the fact that we were able, you know, we had a conversation about art, but we had a conversation about so much more than art. You know, we talked to everything from science to nature to, to people, and it was so eye-opening. And I think everybody here would agree that we, we learned a lot. So I just wanted to give you my sincere thanks for, for taking this time with us today. And we really appreciate you. And, um, and, and I wanted to thank everyone, uh, you know, who, who's been involved. Thank you so much, Elaine, for, for organizing this. This has just been fantastic. I wanted to thank uh, Kaz and Dan for giving a little introduction at the beginning. Those were both amazing. And um, just thank you so, so much. <laughs> We'll see them tomorrow at. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. We uh, are having a second um, event for Indigenous Peoples Day. We're just going to do it tomorrow at 530. We're going to have a screening of the documentary Dawnland. It's going to be in the Henry Science Center in room 275. And Dr. Ryan Watson will be uh, hosting that one. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Holly. And we will see you at Dawnland tomorrow.